to get through. Yep, there you go. Okay. Hello, I'm Bruce Ingleby, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this webinar. Um, so I'll give a, an introduction to radius on measurements and the processing needed, and then I'll talk about work that we've done at ECMWF, looking at the data and changing our system to use it better. And um, the work has benefited from conversations with lots of people. I won't go through the list, but I'll mention the radius on experts from the UK Met Office, from the German Weather Service DWD, and Faisal in Finland. Thank you. And for those that don't know, uh, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts is supported by 34 different countries and it produces some of the best global weather forecasts available. We are based in Reading in the UK and I was pleased to discover at our local parish church they have a millennium window including a uh, an image of a radius on and as, as a sort of indication of ECMWF's presence in the parish. Anyway, on with the main talk. Uh, there are about 800 land stations worldwide, uh, 175 are designated as GUAN or climate uprest stations and 15 are GRUAN, or reference stations. There are a number of ships launching radiosons, uh, particularly in the North Atlantic, the EASAPs, and sometimes there are drop sons from aircraft, particularly around tropical cyclones. Radiosons do in situ measurements of temperature, humidity, and some have a pressure sensor and others don't. Position and winds used to come from radar. Now in many cases it comes from GPS. Uh, there is an instrument package which swings around under the balloon and this swinging does have effect. You get noise in the winds and spikes in the temperature, um, which the, the spikes tend to be removed by processing. Um, in daylight at upper level, levels, there are significant solar radiation effects. I'll say a bit more about those. And upper tropospheric humidity Humidity measurements are difficult because the sensor reacts more slowly in very cold conditions and there are also radiation effects. And in some cases, cloud contamination from icing at lower levels. And something about the strengths and weaknesses of radiosondes. They provide full profiles of temperature, wind, and humidity. I mean, the humidity is more difficult at upper levels, as I've said. Um, for the best radius ons, it's usable up to the tropopause. For others, ECMWF uses it until a temperature of minus 40 Celsius or 300 hectopascals. And radiosons can provide a lot of detail in the vertical. I'll show an example. The uncertainties of radiosons are fairly well characterized and they act to anchor the NWP system, can be used for climate reference, um, yeah, and calib 
indirect calibration of satellite soundings. And in general, they're the closest to ground truth that we have. Um, they are fairly expensive, which limits the sampling. We get rather few over the ocean. And you do need access to electricity, gas, and good communications. And at remote stations, these can be a problem. And there is some variation in quality. Some radio sound types are better than others. So this is an example of the kind of vertical resolution that a radio sound can give. The solid blue line shows a high resolution radius on descent with a very strong inversion. Uh, this is temperature and the dew point temperature. Uh, the blue dashed line is the ECMWF background or short range forecast. And you can see two things here um, that the um, boundary layer is too shallow in the forecast and it isn't as sharp as in the observation. The ECMWF model has 137 levels, which is state of the art, um, but it's not sufficient to capture the sharpness of this feature. The analysis, the purple dashed line, uh, gets the boundary layer depth a bit better, and it certainly improves the temperature. You can argue about the humidity. And no or very few other observations could give us this level of detail. Um, for example, satellite soundings give integrated measurements which are not good at telling you about inversion height or sharpness. And in, a, in an assimilation, they will tend to move the temperature profile left or right rather than move the top of the boundary layer. And I mentioned the pendulum motion. Um, this shows the U and V wind components offset. Um, the light, the gray curve shows the instantaneous winds and the red shows the um, time average winds, which are intended to and largely do take out the high frequency noise. Um, as you can see to some extent from this, the noise varies at different levels in the vertical. It also varies from day to day. And there is a fundamental question, how, how much is noise and how much is signal? And it, it, it's certainly not clear to me from looking at a plot like this. And some operational radio sounds may oversmooth the winds. I mentioned uh, the diurnal variation of temperature uncertainty. The top plot here, taken from a paper by Dirksen et al., shows the uncertainty in the daytime, and the lower plot shows the nighttime. And you do get a measure of the fact. Um, at night time that the uncertainty is more or less constant with height, whereas in the daytime it's increasing a lot at the upper levels. Um, this is from the GRUAN, the reference upper air network processing. Um, move on to the next. Um, the Transmission of data is coordinated through WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, and it used to use alphanumeric codes, notably the temp code, and now there is a migration to buffer, a binary code, which was supposed to be completed some years ago, but is not yet complete. Um, ECMWF has been helping and monitoring the process. 
Um, and the migration to buffer is more complicated for radiosols than it is for surface data because there's a change of structure. Uh, no longer are there parts A, B, C, and D. The whole of the profile should be available in one report. And this makes it difficult to simply um, convert from one format to the other. For surface data, conversion does work for radiosons. It doesn't really work. Uh, there is a paper from 2016 about the process towards high resolution radiosom reports. Um, and the data should be available soon to those not, not working at NWP centers. The plot shows an example from a ship uh, with 10 second vertical reporting. So you can see the black line showing the alphanumeric data, 40 levels. Uh, this is wind speed. The buffer, 400 levels in this case. For some uh, reports, we get 4,000 or more levels. And the, you can see the extra detail in the buffer. And in this case, the green dashed line shows the ECMWF background. Now, the migration is slow, but there is progress. Um, four or five years ago, it was mainly Europe and Australia sending high resolution data. Um, over the years, more countries have started sending data until it's almost 50% of stations sending um, what we call native buffer now. Um, most but not all of the native buffer is high resolution. About a quarter of stations are still um, providing reports that are converted from alphanumeric, which is not not very usable as far as we're concerned, and a quarter to provide no buffer. So there is still quite a way to go. One other point on this map is that you see the rather uneven distribution and the particular gaps in Africa and the coverage there has got somewhat worse in recent years. I'm not going to go through this slide, but just to mention to anyone that is concerned about very small trends over a climate timescale, you should know that there is some rounding in the old alphanumeric code, and I can provide more details of this. Um, so the, the trends that have been going on over the last few years. Um, the Vaisala RS-92 used to be the most widespread radiosond. Vaisala has stopped making that, and many countries are changing to the newer RS-41 or to other radiosonds. Um, and the new Vaisala software allows reporting of descent data, which I'll say more about later. Um, other manufacturers are also moving to new smaller radiosons. And there is a move towards not using a pressure sensor. Uh, the US National Weather Service is um, going through a big procurement and also changing the downlink frequency. The US and other countries are or will be making more use of automated launching systems and some stations are changing or changing back to use hydrogen rather than helium. 
austerity cutbacks in some countries have meant a reduction, sometimes going from two reports a day to one report a day at particular stations. And I'll just say a little bit about the processing of data at NWP centres, and this for comparison shows, um, summarises what is done at the Met Office and at ECMWF. So the alphanumeric data, uh, the Met Office averages that over the model layers. Um, ECMWF tends to use the whole profile from alphanumeric with the high resolution data, ECMWF selects levels up to about three per model level. Both centers do a certain amount of bias correction of temperature and in the ECMWF case humidity. Uh, treatment of drift I'll talk about later and the specification of observation uncertainty which um, is now a function of radius on time as well as the pressure. Um, so now I'll talk about ECMWF tests and changes. I will show observation minus background statistics by radius on type and if I say O minus B that means observation minus background or observation minus short range forecast. Um, some of the experiments that we've done, particularly drift processing, I'll explain a bit about FSOI, um, looking at the impact, bias corrections and descent data. So I've now got a number of slides looking at different radius on types. Uh, this is using data from 2015 and 2016 and there is an ECMWF tech memo about this. Uh, I'll be showing the mean and RMS O minus B and but there is variation with latitude of these so I'm going to show results split by latitude. Um, now this shows the current distribution of radius on types and the RS41 is currently the most used. If you go back three or four years many of the stations sending RS41 were sending RS92. I won't go into the other details on this map. So this shows uh, temperature statistics for the RS92, which was the most common radius on at the time, and also a very good quality radius on. Um, so there are four latitude bands shown. Uh, top left is 50 to 90 north, top right is 20 to 50 north, top Bottom left is the tropics, and bottom right is the southern extra tropics. Um, the bias is shown dashed, and the RMS is solid. And I want to point out two aspects of the bias on this. Um, in the extra tropics, there is some bias in the um, in the lower stratosphere. And this is largely a problem with the ECMW forecast system. Uh, and there is also a tropical cold bias in the model at low levels. Um, these are the same plots and I'll draw attention to two aspects of the RMS. Um, Near the surface, 
in the northern high latitudes, there are some large RMSs. This is particularly at 1,000 hectopascals. And this is because over Russia, Alaska, and so on, you can have very large temperature inversions, which the model only partially captures. Um, in the tropics, we see larger stratospheric RMS than in the extratropics. And I think this is largely due to there being more gravity waves in the tropics. And that there tends to be a bit of a peak at the tropopause level, which is obviously varying with latitude. And now I'm adding all the different radius on types. And um, you can see they've got features in common. And there are also one or two outliers. The Russian radiosons, the red line, have somewhat worse RMS. Um, I mentioned gravity waves, and this is showing examples from Chile. Uh, in the temperature, you can see them in the winds as well at times. And this is four different cases. So solid line is the radius on, red dashed line is the background. And the remarkable thing here is that at times, like uh, the top right case, the background does a very good job. And in some of the other cases, it does a very poor job of representing the gravity waves or other waves. And this is partly to do with the vertical scale of the wave, um, as you would expect. Um, these are similar plots for relative humidity. Um, now, in the lower troposphere, up to about 400 hectopascals, the statistics are fairly similar between the different radius on types. Um, but at upper levels, there is a lot more variation. And there are quite large biases to the Russian data in particular. They are particularly susceptible to contamination after going through cloud. Um, yeah, in general, the Vaisala radius ons do best for upper tropospheric relative humidity. This is most obvious in the tropics. OK, I'll move on. And this is a similar plot, but for the wind statistics. Um, the solid line in this case shows a vector wind RMS, and the dashed line shows a wind speed bias. The background wind speeds are slightly low compared to the observed ones. Um, the RMSs are quite comparable between the different radius on types. So when ECMWF put in different observation errors for different radius and types for temperature and humidity, we decided to leave them all the same for wind. And in some cases, there is a suggestion that there is over smoothing of the winds, as I mentioned. And there is, in the stratosphere, there are somewhat larger differences in the tropics than in extra tropics. And again, this may be due to gravity waves. Um, geopotential height, we don't assimilate, but it is used for verification. And the last five years or so, there's been a number of complaints that radiosondes um, 
heights, particularly at 500 hectopascals, which is a, a sort of standard level, are not accurate enough to use for short range verification. And I have looked at this issue, and I think the main problem is that a fraction of radiosondes, perhaps 10%, have relatively large biases in their heights and in most cases this is due to a station height error either in total or to the height assumed for the pressure sensor and we came across one case for station in Greenland, the plot at the top right, uh, which had a height bias of 40 meters. And it did, which was to do with using an unadjusted GPS height. It wasn't adjusted to mean sea level. And we contacted the operator and they fixed it. And after that, it agreed much better with the ECMW forecast. So the blue lines, the months after the change, show much better agreement with the ECMW forecast system. Um, one other aspect is that the extra precision in buffer does help somewhat with for height and the differences with the model height. Right, now I'm going to talk about radius on drift processing. Um, <clears throat> in the early days of forecasting, and until quite recently, most centers treated radius ons as vertical and instantaneous, and they're not. Um, it takes something like two hours for a balloon to reach um, 35 kilometers. And during that time, it can drift 200 kilometers or more. Um, it, it, the, the, the amount of drift does vary a lot from case to case, month to month, as the bottom plot shows. It does tend to be further in winter. Uh, there was some nice work done in Canada by the Roche and Sarazan about treatment of radius on drift. And in 2018, ECMWF implemented treatment of drift in our NWP system. For technical reasons, we split the ascent into 15 minute intervals and within each interval we treat it as vertical and instantaneous. Um, and in a few months time, we're going to add a check on the drift positions because occasionally there are errors in those. And this just shows another <clears throat> example of a fairly large drift and including a case over 300 kilometers. Now, this does improve the fit between the observation and the background. Um, this shows temperature left and the U wind on the right. The black line is without drift taken into account and the red line is with drift taken into account. And um, you can see improvements of between five and 10% in the RMS fit at 100 hectopascals and above. And slightly more surprisingly, the wind bias has improved a little bit as well. The 
improvement does come largely from the better observation operator. And as I said, we get more drift in the winter hemisphere. Um, this uh, shows the verification of forecasts at different forecast range against the analysis. This is for vector wind and blue uh, height or pressure against latitude. And the blue indicates that there is a better fit. And you can see that certainly at the shorter ranges out to two or three days, um, it's mainly blue in the lower stratosphere. So we do see some improvements in the forecasts at relatively short range. For some reason, the improvement seemed more marked in the southern extratropics than the northern extratropics. This particular example was done um, two or three years ago, and there are more radius ons giving us drift now, so we would hope to see a bigger impact now. <clears throat> some of you have heard of forecast sensitivity to observation impact, or FSOI. Um, it's one way of looking at the impact of observations. In some sense, the ideal is observing system experiments, which is to change one aspect of the observing system and rerun the whole NWP system and then look at the different scores. Um, but that is really quite expensive, particularly if you want to take out various different observation types. FSOI uses a linear approximation and a single score, um, often verification against analysis at T plus 24, using a global energy norm and there are various approximations in this. It also doesn't include cumulative effects, such as the use of radius ons in helping to anchor or provide bias corrections within an NWP system. Now, over time, satellite FSOI is tending to increase. Um, more data, better processing, and so there is some decrease in the FSOI of conventional observations. For aircraft, this is offset by increased aircraft numbers, but w we do see some evidence that the FSOI of a high resolution ascent is about twice that of a low resolution ascent. And this is a useful tool, but it needs to be interpreted with care. And this shows our average FSOI for last year, 2018. And the brown segment shows the radius on impact using this measure. And it's similar in magnitude to the sign-off impact, rather less than aircraft. And you can see big chunks from microwave and infrared satellite data. Um, I have said some of this. Um, at times, there have been indications that ECMWF is getting less impact from radius ons than the Met Office, possibly due to suboptimal use of significant level data. Um, that problem is reducing as we move to buffer data. Possibly more use of satellite data at ECMWF. Um, and also a technical reason to do with the ECMWF 12-hour windows. 
There have been two recent ECMWF tech memos by Borman et al. and Lawrence et al., which you might want to look at if you're interested in the impact of data. They haven't separated out radiosondes, but they've combined it, combined them with surface and aircraft data, and found that conventional observations are still very important, and particularly in the Arctic in winter, conventional observations seem to be the most important source. Now, this again shows two changes to radius on bias treatment, A and B, I'll, call, I'll go into the details in a moment. This is uh, measured against analysis height, verification against analysis height, and again, in general terms, blue is smaller differences, which is generally a good thing. And the left plot, you can see a mixture, um, probably marginally better. The right plot, you might think, oh, this is, this is a wonderful change. Um, and then I'll tell you we made change A and not change B. But change A was a change the reference used for the radius on bias correction. For many years, um, the system used nighttime autosond RS92 as a reference. And we realized that the numbers of the reference observations were declining quite strongly, so we had to change things. And we changed to use the average of RS92 and RS41. Um, the change was made last year, and the impact is relatively small, but we think if we hadn't made that, our system would have been getting worse by now. Now, the other change was a sensitivity test. Uh, I ran two tests, one adding half a degree to all radius on temperatures, and the other subtracting half a degree from all radius on temperatures. Um, the analysis fields didn't change that much, but it was enough to make a difference to the verification against analysis. And this plot shows one example, um, one level, one, one latitude band, that the, uh, because of climate biases in the system, the model is cooling as it goes into the forecast. And um, the, if you subtract, if you make the radius ones cooler, then that cooling is reduced. But this doesn't mean that the analyses or forecasts are better. This is just a, a warning that with, with all sorts of verification, you have to be a bit careful and look at different measures. Radius on descent data. This is the last main topic. And with radius ons, what goes up has to come down. And they can come down in inconvenient places. I've heard stories of them coming down on roads. Then the road is closed, you get traffic queuing up until the police have checked that it's nothing dangerous. Anyway, right, These, this map shows data where we got ascent and descent data. So the ascent is the blue dots shown every 15 minutes, and the descent is the red dots shown every five minutes. Data from Germany, Finland, and the, and the UK. The radius on keeps transmitting on the way down, 
um, and the station can continue to receive the data until the radius on goes below the horizon. And one of the obvious advantages is that there's, there's little or no extra cost to making the descent data. Um, for now, this is RS41 data. And it is still at the test stage. Um, the, to understand what's going on, we do need to look at the descent rates. And this plot shows descent rates for individual stations averaged over a particular month. Uh, one line per station. Now the red lines are for Finnish stations. Um, Finland uses smaller balloons so they don't go quite as high. And they're not using parachutes so they fall quicker. Um, the green and the blue plots show data for German and UK stations. Uh, both of which use parachutes, so these fall slower. And they're using, mostly using bigger balloons so that they go somewhat higher in the, the atmosphere. So the, the radius arms, they ascend usually between 30 and 35 kilometers, taking about two hours going up at about five meters per second. Um, they tend to fall down in something like 30 minutes, but it does vary quite a lot, depending on whether it's a parachute or not. And the balloon size makes a difference because it's often falling with the remnants of the balloon and more weight makes it fall faster. And the faster speed in the stratosphere is because the air is less dense there. And right, this is observation minus background statistics for ascent data in black and descent data in red. Uh, German stations on top and the Finnish stations on the bottom. UK results tend to be somewhat intermediate. The um, and if we look at the German data top line first, the surprising, perhaps, um, and encouraging result is that the, the statistics are fairly similar on, in general. Um, so it does look as if the descent data might well be usable. Um, at upper levels, there's a difference in temperature bias. The RH is surprisingly similar. For winds, the um, fall rate, the descent RMS is smaller than the ascent RMS which was a surprise. Um, for Finland, we can see that there's a bigger temperature bias for the descent data. It does seem to be linked to the faster descent rate. Um, and just to look a bit more closely at the winds, the top plot shows a descent and the bottom plot shows an ascent for the, for the same radius on. There's, again, the solid line is the reported data and you can see that the descent is winds are somewhat smoother than the ascent winds. And is this due to less pendulum motion? There is at least some evidence to back this up. It could also be due to too much smoothing of the descent data. 
the filtering is the same for the ascent and the descent, as Faisal would tell us. Um, well, it's the same as a function of time, but because it's falling more, more fast, then the effective length scales of the smoothing will be greater for the descent data. So I'll summarize now uh, radius ons. There is some processing on site, removal of temperature spikes, spikes, smoothing out pendulum motion, and trying to reduce solar radiation effects, which is only partially successful. Um, and this is so. What we see is processed data, a lot more processed than, say, a temperature from a Stevenson screen. It's mostly good quality data. Um, there's little correlation of the errors in the vertical. There is some variation with radius on type. There's a move to binary data, higher vertical resolution, better precision and descent data is under test. Um, there are some problem areas. Temperatures, mostly good. There are occasional problems. Wind GPS results are generally pretty good. There can be more problems with sites using radar. Height, I mentioned bias problems at some stations. Um, I mentioned that upper tropospheric humidity is a difficult variable to measure. The best radius ons are usable in the upper troposphere. ECMWF does regular radius on monitoring, um, and we provide the information within Europe via UMetNet, um, but it is available more widely. But once we find a problem, it is up to the National Met Services to try and find the root and correct the problem. Um, NWP, um, there is both direct impact of the radius ons, uh, which is still well worthwhile, and they're more or less the only source of stratospheric wind, say, and they provide full profiles, as I mentioned. There's an indirect impact. Uh, they're used to anchor um, the NWP system and the satellite bias corrections along with GPSRO. Um, th there is something of an issue in that um, you want a large a good proportion of anchor observations and in general that proportion is decreasing over time and there's plenty more work could be done on this anchoring and bias correction. Changes and challenges, quality control and weighting of the observations, treatment of high resolution data, treatment of balloon drift, bias correction, uh, representativeness and I'm, at the moment, I'm doing some work on high resolution drop zones and tropical cyclones, and there's the radius on descent data after balloon burst. And I'll just put up a list of references and we can take some questions now. Thank you. We have some people typing questions. Okay. We can move over there so you can, we can start. Uh, yes, the, certainly for the, the question is, is FSOI for radius zones larger for buffer reports than for the alphanumeric reports? And 
The answer is yes. It's from what we've looked at or Lars has looked at, it's about twice as much for the high resolution report than it is for the lower resolution alphanumeric reports. Okay, thanks. Can you have another one from uh, one? Yes. Uh, could we introduce some quality control method of descent radius arms? Yes. Um, this is an area that I'm actively looking at at the moment and the, the biggest problem seems to be um, temperature biases. We could not use the temperatures in the stratosphere, um, which are spatially quite close to the ascent, so maybe it's not too much of a loss. We could not use the temperatures when the fall rate exceeds a, a particular value, but th th this is one of the things that we want to work on over the next year or two. Uh, a question from Martin Fengler. Have I come across Meteor Drone Systems? And the short answer is no, I haven't. Um, you can send me information if you want. How long does it take for obtaining a radius on profile? It, it takes about two hours to go up. Um, they do tend to send data when it gets to 500 hectopascals, sorry, when it gets to 100 hectopascals. There are discussions going on as to whether it will be good to send data from lower in the profile. That There's sort of technical issues to sort out before that is done. Could I say more about the ascent split into 15-minute chunks? Well, this is the solution that ECMWF has adopted, partly to fit in with our existing system. And if we treated thousands of levels from a particular radius on, it becomes quite inefficient because we would then have a complete background profile for each of them. Um, so it's an efficiency thing, but we may reduce that 15 minutes at some point. Does instrument response time come into play when considering descent data? Um, there might be. Um, I, I don't think it's a big issue, but it, it, it's one thing to bear in mind. Uh, Ground-based radiometric data, we're not really using that at the moment. What effect, if any, do the radius on trends have on the data? Um, I think you've missed um, one well, question from Alexis. It's gone off the top of my screen. Okay, let me. Come up. Um, very active. Yes. Let's see if we can. Oh, I suppose yes. So, Alexis. Okay. Alexis has asked what about VAR BC techniques applied to radius on temperature correction? We don't want to use bar BC directly for radius ons because that would weaken its role as anchor observations. And in general terms, I would prefer to reduce the bias correction, certainly for modern radius on types. Uh, which variable from radius ons is the most important for NWP? That's... I haven't got a single answer for that. Um, 
and to some extent it varies with latitude. In the tropics we could certainly do with more wind profiles and we don't see wind profiles from satellites so wind is an important variable for NWP. Temperature is too, and humidity, actual terrain is, of course. Um, okay, effect. I, I mentioned that quickly. Uh, we, we, we don't use ground based radiometric data at the moment. It's not, as far as I know, sent on the GTS, and there aren't many stations providing it. Um, okay, th these. Question about radius on trends. Automated data, automated launching um, has little effect directly. Um, there might possibly be effects just after the, just near the surface. Hydrogen versus helium again, not directly. Hydrogen balloons tend to go higher than helium balloons. Uh, ECMWF don't, doesn't directly provide recommendations for types of radiosons. Um, I mean, you can look at my technical memo and you will see there are a number of good radiosons types and a number of slightly less good radius on times. And there are WMO radius on into comparisons every so often. There will be another in about two years time. Um, it is, it's certainly not ECMWF's role to directly tell users what radius on they should be using. Um, do I think radiosons are important for limited areas? They, they are to some extent, obviously. And things like getting the boundary layer height correct, that they should be very useful for that. Uh, there's a question about the recent um, GPS epoch rollover, which affected a number of Vaisala radiosons, 20 to 30 worldwide. The number of radiosons was not large, and most of them came back relatively soon, so I don't think it was that large. It was unfortunate, of course, and we did see. Uh, some loss of uh, drifting void data as well. Again, fairly small. There are few observations in polar regions. Is it necessary to get radius on data there for improving NWP skill? It would help. Um, there as you may know, um, there has been a year of polar prediction going on recently with extra releases in the Arctic area and it's now in the Antarctic. I, I guess one of the answers is, are, it depends how many customers you have in the Arctic. Um, as to how much effort you want to um, spend there. And the year of polar prediction, the applicate project will be doing tests with and without Arctic radiosons to try to address this sort of question. Um, I, I don't think I can say anything more on that. Where are we? Um, GPS radius on 
with pressure sensor or without pressure sensor needs more debate. Um, where the, the evidence suggests that mostly um, the GPS heights are sufficiently accurate that a pressure sensor is marginal. It does add a degree of redundancy. Um, and for climate purposes, you might want the pressure sensor in particular. Um, but it, it, it is an area for discussion. Um, question from Elena in Finland. That would be the last one, yeah. Uh, last question, yes. Have we made scenario studies? What happens if we lose all GPS, say for space junk on their orbit? Um, I guess it could have severe solar storms and things as well, space weather. Um, I haven't done that. Um, there was some um, work done on that a few years ago. Uh, there's a tech memo by Radnotti et al, which I can provide a reference to. But yes, I mean, we the main reference or anchor observations now are radius arms and GPSRO. Um, and they are both important. I think we're going to call it a day now. It's three o'clock and thank you for listening. Thank you for all your questions. I hope I've done a reasonable job of answering them. Goodbye.